This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. <laughs> maybe, uh, well, maybe, should I just hold on to it? Yeah, hold <laughs> Aloha, and welcome everyone to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Okay, thanks, Bill. <laughs> it is now time for our special guest. <laughs> We're delighted to welcome an old friend, Michael Greger, MD, a founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, author, and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, appeared on the Dr. Oz Show and the Colbert Report, and was invited as an expert witness in this defense of Oprah Winfrey at the infamous meat defamation trial. He is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. Currently, Dr. Greger serves as the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. Hundreds of his nutrition videos are freely available at nutritionfacts.org with new videos and articles uploaded every other day. Dr. Greger's presentation tonight is entitled Combating Common Diseases with Plants. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Greger. Good evening. <laughs> For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. Every year my presentations are brand new because every year the science is brand new. I then compile all the most interesting, most practical, most groundbreaking work into new videos. I upload to my website, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorship, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, non-profit. The latest in nutritional science, I just put it up as a public service. Enjoy. In my annual presentation last year here in Hawaii, I ran through the 15 leading causes of death, exploring the latest science on the role diet may play in preventing, stopping, and even reversing the progression of our top 15 killers. Or, if you remember, actually our top 16 killers since side effects from prescription drugs kill an estimated 106,000 Americans every year making the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, doctors. <laughs> and that's just from adverse drug reactions. Add in medical mistakes, which the Institute of Medicine estimates kills off another 44,000 Americans every year, and that brings doctors up to here. Throw in some hospital-acquired infections, and we're talking maybe 187,000 Americans dead, millions injured by medical care. Now the best way to avoid the adverse effects of medical tests and treatments is not to avoid doctors, it's to avoid getting sick in the first place. So this year I thought I'd run through the top dozen reasons people visit their physicians in hopes of moving me lower down the list of common killers. <laughs> the primary disease diagnosis in office visits is respiratory tract infections, like the common cold. Most Americans report uh, between eh, two to three colds a year. Uh, now this year I featured evidence 
that simple water gargling may be effective in preventing upper respiratory tract infections. This virtually cost-free modality may appreciably benefit people, but that's the problem. It's cost-free. That's why you probably never heard of this research, right? If there's a new drug or surgical procedure, you, you can bet you'll know about it because there's a corporate budget driving its promotion. Uh, that's why you'll never see an ad on TV for broccoli. <laughs> Same with exercise. Can also improve immunity, decrease illness rates from respiratory infections. We're talking a 25 to 50 percent drop in sick days. Name one drug or supplement that can do that. Doesn't exist. And it doesn't take much. Let our kids run around for just six minutes we can boost the number of immune cells in their bloodstream by about a third in just six minutes. The other end of the life cycle exercise may help prevent age-related immune decline. Sedentary women in their 70s have about a 50% chance of getting upper respiratory tract infection every fall season. But walk a half hour a day may cut your risk down to 20% and runners in the group got it under 10. Right? Looks like exercise can make our immune systems five times more effective. Exercise is medicine. Who wouldn't want a boosted immune system? Well, I mean, millions of people do suffer from autoimmune diseases whose immune system may already be a little too active. So might a healthy lifestyle make things worse by boosting immune function further? No, those who eat healthy appear protected from autoimmune diseases. Given the extraordinary rarity of most of these diseases among those eating traditional plant-based diets. For example, before they westernized their diet, not a single case of multiple sclerosis was diagnosed among a population of 15 million people. What about treating autoimmune diseases with a plant-based diet? Well, even a semi vegetarian diet it was found to successfully treat Crohn's disease, which is an important study out of Japan, better than any other intervention. The best result in relapse prevention, period. And look, Crohn's is an autoimmune disease, so what about treating MS with diet? Well, the most frequently prescribed drug for multiple sclerosis, what's called beta interferon, which can make you feel lousy, costs $30,000 a year, but hey, it might be worthwhile if it actually worked. But unfortunately, we learned recently, does not appear to prevent or delay long-term disability. And that leaves chemo drugs like mitoxantrone that causes irreversible heart damage in one out of every eight people who go on the drug and treatment-related acute leukemia. It causes cancer in about uh, nearly 1% of people who take it. But hey, MS is no walk in the park. If only there was some cheap, simple, safe, side effect free solution that also happened to be the most effective treatment for MS ever described. Dr. Roy Swank, who we lost unfortunately recently, age 99, was a distinguished neurologist whose research culminated in over 170 scientific papers, but I'll just cut to the chase. He found that in all probability MS was caused largely by the consumption of saturated animal fat. Now, he thought it was the sludging of the blood caused by even a single meal high in animal fat, which may clog tiny capillaries, the blood vessels that feed our nerves. But now we know animal fats have all sorts of other adverse effects, such as inflammation. So we're not sure what the actual mechanism may be regardless. The results Dr. Swank published remain the most effective treatment a multiple sclerosis ever published in the peer-reviewed medical literature. In patients with early stage MS, 95% were without progression of the disease, what, six months later? No, 34 years later. After adopting his low saturated fat dietary program, to date no medication or intervention ever even comes close to demonstrating that kind of remarkable success. It doesn't cost $30,000, doesn't give you leukemia, and works better. Now, neurological problems are number two on the list, but tend to be more common conditions like headaches, 
Um, feel free to check out my videos on treating migraine headaches by rubbing lavender oil on the upper lip. Hot sauce in the nose for cluster headaches, believe me, it's better than having cluster headaches. <laughs> I've talked about both preventing and treating Parkinson's since it was, it's one of our leading killers, so I talked about Parkinson's last year, but the most common movement disorders, not Parkinson's, it's what's called essential tremor, affecting one in 25 adults over 40, and the one in five by the time we make it to our 90s, making it one of the most common neurological diseases. Now, in addition to this potentially debilitating hand tremor that people get, there's also neuropsychiatric manifestations of the disease, difficulty walking, cognitive impairment. What causes it? Well, there's a group of neurotoxins that produce tremor called beta-carbolein alkaloids. Harmane is one of these potent uh, tremor-producing neurotoxins. You expose people to these chemicals, they develop a tremor. You remove the chemicals from people, the tremor disappears. All right. So what if you're exposed long term? Well, this recent study found that those with essential tremor had much higher levels of these toxins in their systems compared to those without tremor. How did they get exposed to it? Through meat. Actually, beef, pork, chicken, um, fish uh, actually as well. So if this potent tremor-producing neurotoxin is concentrated in cooked muscle foods, it's one of these heterocyclic amines. I say it's actually created by the cooking process when you cook muscles. I mean, is meat consumption associated with higher risk of essential tremor? Men who ate the most meat in this study, 21 times the odds of essential tremor. And just to put that in context for those not familiar with reading a lot of studies like this, smoking, if you look at the original studies on smoking and lung cancer, smoking was linked at most 14 times the odds of lung cancer, not 21. That's like a 2,000% increase in risk in odds for this disabling brain disorder. Next on the list, circulatory diseases. The number one cause, heart disease, number one cause of death for men and women. Now, populations who ate plant-based diets, who ate diets centered around unprocessed plant foods, you know, MS was practically non-existent. What about heart disease? Well, recently in the International Journal of Epidemiology, they republished this landmark study from the 50s, which started out with a shocking statement. The shocking statement was that in the African population of Uganda, coronary heart disease was practically non-existent. So wait a second, our number one cause of death, practically non-existent, what were they eating? Well, if you're familiar with the traditional Hawaiian diet, it's actually very similar, right? This kind of starch-based diet, lots of vegetables, green leafy vegetables uh, taken by all, and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, actually very similar to what you see in modern day plant eaters. So well, well, look, maybe the Africans were just dying early of something else and never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, this is age-matched heart attack rates, Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 autopsies in St. Louis, age and gender match, so same age and gender distribution, 132. 36, excuse me, myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our number one killer. In fact, they were so blown away, they did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, and still, just that one small heel infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,427 patients, less than one in 1,000, whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. This is a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that eat and live like the U.S., but are rare or even non-existent among populations. Eating diets centered around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, hiatal hernia, one of the most common stomach problems, hemorrhoids and varicose veins, the two most common venous problems. Colorectal cancer, number two cause of cancer death. Diverticulosis is the most common disease of the intestine. 
Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery, gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, and ischemic heart disease, the commonest cause of death here, but a rarity among plant-based populations. Suggesting that heart disease is a choice, like cavities. If you look at people who lived over 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no Listerine, no water pick, never flossed at all, <laughs> yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. Right? So you say, wait a second, why do people still get cavities if we know they're preventable through dietary change? Well, simple, because the pleasure people derive from dessert outweighs the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. All right, fine. Look, if you're an adult and if you feel that the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I got a good dental plan. But what if instead of talking about the plaque on our teeth, we're instead talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries? Then what are the consequences for you and your family? Right? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. The most likely reason most of our loved ones will die is because of heart disease. It's still up to each and every one of us to decide you know, what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Right? Now, this is a similar disease. This disease can be prevented by diet as well. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, the arteries of nearly all kids have what are called fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease. And then the plaques start forming in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart, it's a heart attack. In our brain, it's a stroke. In our limbs, it can mean gangrene, in our aorta, an aneurysm. If there is anyone in this room today Older than age 10. <laughs> then the question isn't whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease that you already have. Ornish and Esselstyn proved you can reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just with a a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. We don't want to wait till our first heart attack, though, to start unclogging our arteries. We can start unclogging our arteries right now. We can start unclogging the arteries of our kids tonight. How do we do it? All right. Well, according to the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, the only risk factor required for our number one killer is cholesterol, elevated LDL, bad cholesterol in our blood. Now, so to drop our LDL cholesterol, we need to drop our intake of three things, and that's trans fats, saturated fats, and dietary cholesterol. Trans fats increase our risk of heart disease, sudden death, diabetes, and are found basically only one place in nature, and that's animal fat. Now, the food industry found a way to synthetically create these um, toxic fats by hardening vegetable oil in a process called hydrogenation, which rearranges their atoms, make them act more like animal fats. Currently, nearly half of Americans' trans fat intake comes from animal products. According to the USDA, cheese, milk, yogurt, chicken fat, turkey meat, bologna, hot dogs, contains about 1 to 5% trans fats naturally. It doesn't have hydrogenated oils, just naturally these animal fats have trans fats. Also, small amounts of trans fats are found in refined, non-hydrogenated vegetable oils just because of the refining process. 
But look, is getting a few percent trans fats really a problem? Well, the most prestigious scientific body in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences, concluded that the only safe intake of trans fats was zero. Because any incremental increase in trans fatty acid intake increases our risk of heart disease. Trans fat intake, irrespective of source, whether from you know, hydrogenated junk food or animal fat, increase cardiovascular disease risk. Now, because trans fats are unavoidable on a non-vegan diet, uh, you know, getting down to 0% trans fats you know, that would be a big change for most Americans. One of the authors of the report, director of Harvard's cardiovascular epidemiology program, famously explained why, despite this, they didn't come out and recommend a plant-based diet. He said, well, you can't tell people to stop eating all meat and all dairy products. Well, we could tell people to become vegetarians yet, and if we were truly basing this only on science, we would, but it is a bit extreme. Wouldn't want scientists basing anything on science, now would we? No. Avoiding saturated fat means basically avoiding dairy, chicken, cake, and pork. And avoiding cholesterol means avoiding all animal products, but particularly eggs. The American Egg Board is a promotional marketing board appointed by the U.S. government, whose mission is to increase demand for egg and egg products on behalf of U.S. egg producers. Now, because the board is overseen by the federal government, if an egg corporation wants to dip into the $10 million it sets aside every year for advertising, they're not allowed to break the law with those funds. What a concept. And so this leads to quite revealing exchanges between egg companies that wanted that money and the USDA on what can and cannot be said about eggs. Thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to get my hands on some of those emails. Would you like to see a few? Yeah. Of course, a lot of them look like this. <laughs> Please note a number of items about our Salmonella Crisis Support Module. Any questions? <laughs> or even better, entire sheets of paper that literally just said this. Please consider the environment before printing this email. That, but that's all it said on the entire piece of sheet of paper. Our tax dollars hard at work. All right. All right, but check this out. This is some egg company trying to put out a brochure on healthy snacking for kids. But because of existing laws against false and misleading advertising, the head of the USDA's poultry promotion program reminds them that you cannot couch eggs or egg products as being healthy or nutritious. See, the words healthy and nutritious carry certain connotations. You know, like food's actually good for you. Uh, but because eggs have the amount of cholesterol plus all the saturated fat, the words healthy and nutritious are problematic when it comes to eggs. Right? This is the USDA talking. Since you can't say eggs are a healthy start to the day, the USDA suggests satisfying star. Can't call eggs a healthy ingredient, but you can call eggs a recognizable ingredient. Can't truthfully say eggs are good for you by law. The egg industry needs to steer clear of words like healthy or nutritious. For food to be labeled healthy under FDA rules, it has to be low in saturated fat. Eggs fail that test. And less than 90 milligrams of cholesterol per serving, even half an egg fails that test. Not only is the industry barred from saying eggs are healthy, they cannot even refer to eggs as safe. All references to safety must be removed. Remember, this is the USDA talking. Why? because more than 100,000 Americans are sickened by salmonella-tainted eggs year after year. Instead of safe, you can call eggs fresh, the USDA suggests, but you can't call eggs safe. You can't, cannot say eggs are safe to eat, can't say they're safe, can't even mention safety, can't say they're healthful. All references to healthfulness must be removed as well. Wait a second, not only can you not call eggs healthy, you can't even call them safe? Says who? 
says the United States Department of Agriculture. Musculoskeletal connective tissue disorders are next. No, I assumed uh, cholesterol drugs were our number one class of drugs prescribed, but no, it's actually painkillers for conditions like fibromyalgia syndrome suffered by millions, which can be dramatically improved with a variety of plant-based diets. In fact, better, uh, producing some of the most impressive results to date. I've already covered both diabetes and depression because they were leading causes of death, so I did that last year. Moving down the list, pap smears for early detection of cervical cancer, common reason for a doctor's visit. Cervical cancer is now considered a sexually transmitted disease caused by a sexually transmitted virus called HPV. Now, most young women these days contract HPV, but most don't get cancer because their immune systems are able to clear the virus away. 70% of women are able to clear this virus within, within one year, 90% within two years before the virus can cause cancer, unless you're immunocompromised or something. Well, if that's the case, maybe women with really strong immune systems are able to clear the virus even faster. That's what may be behind this study that found that vegetarian women a significantly lower rates of infection rates of HPV, one of many studies showing that very same thing. So for example, if you take a bunch of women who have uh, confirmed cancer-causing strains of HPV infecting their cervix, and you retest them at three months and nine months, all while analyzing their diets, what do you find? You find that higher levels of vegetable consumption may cut the risk of HPV persistence in half, doubling the likelihood that women will clear this cancer-causing infection. What? With what? With vegetables. And by higher vegetables, they're just talking about a few servings a day made all the difference. And this may explain these important new findings out last year. Vegan women have significantly lower rates of all female cancers combined, including a cancer of the cervix. So even though it's a virus that's actually causing the cancer, doesn't mean that diet cannot have a, uh, a significant effect in reducing the risk. In the same way that fermented pickles, kimchi, sauerkraut, foster the growth of good bacteria by maintaining an acidic environment, so does the human vagina. The normal pH of one's vagina is that of tomato juice. Once it starts creeping up to that of coffee, though, an overgrowth of bad bacteria can, grow, um, can uh, take hold, cause what's called bacterial vaginosis, which affects an astounding 29% of American women, making it the most common cause of vaginal complaints. It's commonly diagnosed with the so-called whiff test, where the doctor takes a whiff of the vaginal discharge, smelling for the characteristic fishy odor. Why is it so common? Well, it's thought to be that high fat intake, particularly saturated fat, remember dairy, chicken, cake, and pork, uh, may increase vaginal pH, thereby increasing the risk of bacterial vaginosis. So now that we know, what are we going to do about it? Well, we need to tell OBGYNs and general practitioners and the general community about the role that an optimal diet may play in, in maintaining reproductive health. What might saturated fat be doing to the reproductive health of men? Well, a recent Harvard study found that just a 5% increase in saturated fat intake associated with a 30 8% lower sperm count. But why? Well, I've talked about the role of xenoestrogens, these endocrine disrupting industrial pollutants building up in the food chain, particularly the aquatic food chain. So this is sperm counts of vegetarians versus those that eat fish. But it's not just of the number of sperm, the sperm count, but also how well the sperms work. I'm more on that for those interested in my video, Male Fertility and Diet. When it comes to male reproductive health, this is what doctors hear about the most. Erectile dysfunction is present in up to 30 million men in the United States, 100 million men worldwide. Wait a second. The United States only has about 5% of the world's population, yet 30% of the impotence? We're number one! <laughs> <clears throat> Who 
cares though? We got red, white, and blue pills like Viagra. The problem is pills just cover up the symptoms of vascular disease, don't do anything for the underlying pathology. Right? Erectile dysfunction and coronary artery disease can be thought of as two manifestations of the same disease. Right? Clogged, inflamed, crippled arteries. 40% of men over 40, 40 over 40, have erectile dysfunction, placing them at nearly 50, 50 times the risk of a cardiac event like sudden death. Nearly 5,000% increase in risk, uh, leading to the latest review to ask, I mean, is there any risk greater than that? You know, we used to think erectile dysfunction in younger men in their 20s, 30s, so-called psychogenic in origin, meaning, oh, it's all in their heads. But no, now we're realizing there's likely an early manifestation of vascular disease. A man with erectile dysfunction, even if they have no cardiac symptoms, should be considered a cardiac patient until proven otherwise. The reason young men should care about their cholesterol levels is because hardening of the arteries can lead to softening of the penis even decades down the road. Your cholesterol level now will predict sexual functioning later in life. Just going to keep eating crap because you know you can pop some pills. Well, all the Viagra in the world may not help your sex life after a stroke. <laughs> the take home message is a simple equation. ED stands for early death. It's survival of the firmest. <clears throat> <laughs> the enzyme that uh, Viagra-like drugs muck with is actually found two places in the body, not just the erectile tissue of the penis, um, but also the retinas of the eyes. That's the one other place this enzyme is found. And so that's why the FDA encourages people to stop taking drugs like Viagra and call your doctor right away if you experience sudden loss of vision. That is, if you can still find your phone at that point. But, uh, <laughs> but that brings us to the next group of primary diagnoses, injury and poisonings, which include adverse drug reactions. Next comes skin complaints. Any hope for cellulite? Well, check out the video. Basically, researchers compared a meat-free, egg-free diet of mostly vegetables, grains, beans, fruit, and nuts to the conventional official diabetic diet. And the veg group lost more weight, even though they were made to eat the exact same number of calories, same calories, but still lost more weight, lost more waste, got slimmer, lost more cholesterol, more sub-Q fat, and more belly fat as well. Um, and it's that sub-Q fat that's actually uh, what makes up cellulite. And those with sensitive skin may want to give flax seeds, ground flax seeds, a try. Next up, digestive issues. Though there is an international prune association keeping us all apprised of prune news from around the world, in the U.S., the California Prune Board successfully pressured the FDA to change the name of prunes to dried plums, which evidently evokes more of a positive fresh fruit goodness image in hopes of attracting their target audience, women. Of course, it might actually help if they put a few on the board. <coughs> But the name change was in hopes of de-emphasizing the uh, connections to digestive regularity issues. But why sell yourself short, though? Randomized clinical trial prunes versus Metamucil. And nearly 60 million Americans suffer from chronic constipation. Here's the study subjects at baseline. Each one of those little dots represents a complete spontaneous bowel movement. Note how many people had zero bowel movements per week at baseline, um, but an average of 1.7 a week went up to 3.5 on prunes, at least every other day, significantly better than the Metamucil. And so they conclude, look, dried plums could be, should be considered first-line therapy um, for patients with chron chronic constipation. Before doctors think about drugs, they should think about prunes. But look, if that's what adding one plant to the diet can do, what if all you ate was plants? Off the charts. <laughs> Vegans, it turns out, are just regular people. <clears throat> 
I also cover other chronic digestive issues such as irritable bowel, chronic indigestion, but what about cancer? A half million Americans are expected to die this year from cancer. That's equal to five jumbo jets crashing every day. Number of Americans who die from cancer every year more than all of the Americans that have died in all U.S. wars combined, and that happens every year. But a tumor cannot grow, though, without a blood supply. Currently, it's believed a tumor cannot get bigger than the ball at the tip of a ballpoint pen without a blood supply, which indicates that angiogenesis, angio means vessel genesis, the creation of new blood vessels, critical for tumor growth. The bad news is that each one of us has tumor cells in us right now, but they can't grow without getting hooked up to a blood supply. So tumors diabolically release these angiogenic factors which causes our blood vessels to sprout into the tumors. The most important one is called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, but we can suppress VEGF with veggies. Many of the phytonutrients we know and love in tea and spices and fruit and broccoli and berries and beans can block cancer stimulation of new blood vessels. Given the power of plants, one can speculate that the foundation of an anti-angiogenic approach to cancer maybe a whole food, vegan diet. How else can we starve cancer? Well, 40 years ago, a landmark paper was published showing that many human cancers have what's called absolute methionine dependency, meaning normal cells thrive without the amino acid methionine, but cancer cells need it or they die. What does cancer do with methionine? Well, tumors use methionine to generate these gaseous sulfur-containing compounds that you know, specially trained diagnostic dogs can actually pick up. There are mole-sniffing dogs that can pick out people with skin cancer. <coughs> there are breath-sniffing dogs that can diagnose lung cancer. Pee-sniffing dogs that can pick out bladder cancer. And yes, you guessed it, fart-sniffing dogs for colorectal cancer. <laughs> Doctors can now bring their lab to the lab. <laughs> Whole new meaning to the term, PET scan. <laughs> so chemo companies are fighting to become the first to come out with a methionine-depleting drug. But you say, wait a second. Since methionine is sourced mainly from food, a better strategy may be to lower methionine levels by just lowering methionine intake, avoiding high methionine foods, okay? And this is for both cancer growth control as well as lifespan extension. So where is methionine found? Particularly chicken and fish, number one, actually meat, red meat, milk and eggs have less, but if you really want to stick with low methionate foods, we need to stick with plants, fruits, nuts, veggies, grains, and beans. In other words, in humans, methionine restriction may be achieved through a predominantly plant-based diet, making methionine restriction feasible, though, as a life extension strategy. So does this actually work in the real world? I mean, do people who eat beans live longer? Legumes, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils may be the single most important dietary predictor of longevity among older people around the world. You want to know how long a population lives? You ask one question, how many beans do they eat? Whereas a bean-free diet actually increase the risk of death. It's been about a decade since the famous Ornish study was published, suggesting that 12 months on a strict plant-based diet may reverse the progression of prostate cancer. So wait a second, how are you able to get a group of older men to eat vegan for a year? Well, they home delivered prepared meals to their doorstep, figuring, look, men are so lazy, they'll just eat whatever's kind of put in front of them. 
and it worked. <laughs> All right, but what about out in the real world? Well, realizing we can't even get most men with cancer to eat five measly servings of fruits and vegetables a day, they settled on just trying to change men's A to V ratio, the ratio of animal to vegetable proteins, and were indeed able to successfully cut this ratio in half from about two to one animal to plant to more like one to one, kind of half vegan. How did they do? Well, a part-time plant-based diet appeared to be able to slow down the cancer growth. So, you know, what Ornish got was a reversal the cancer biomarker PSA didn't just go up slower, it actually went down, suggesting tumor shrinkage. Right? So the ideal animal to plant ratio may be closer to zero. But if there's just no way grandpa's going vegan, and we just have half measures, what might be the worst A and the best V? Well, eggs and poultry may be the worst respectfully doubling and potentially quadrupling the risk of cancer progression. Harvard researchers found twice the risk eating less than a single egg a day, quadruple the risk eating less than a single serving of chicken or turkey. And when you're talking of cancer progression, we're talking about you know spread to the bone or death, things like that. And if we can only add one thing to our diet, it would be cruciferous vegetables less than a single serving a day of broccoli or Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, may cut the risk of cancer progression in half. Similar result found among breast cancer survivors, less than a single serving a day may cut the risk of cancer recurrence in half. This Women's Healthy Eating and Living study looked at thousands of breast cancer survivors to see what a plant-based a diet, whether it could influence breast cancer survival rates and recurrence rates. Imagine you've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. In fact, estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, which normally means twice the death rate unless you eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day and exercise an average of a half an hour a day, six days a week. So this so-called high vegetable fruit and physical activity group really should be in quotes. I mean, you could eat five servings of fruits and vegetables in a single meal, right? And certainly walk more than two miles a day. But imagine for a second you've been diagnosed. Imagine sitting in that chair as the doctor comes back in the room and breaks the news. Imagine how you'd feel at that moment. But there's an experimental treatment that can cut your chances of dying over the next few years from 16% down to just 4%. To quadruple their survival rate, many women would remortgage their home to fly to some quack clinic in Mexico, lose all their hair to chemo, but most apparently couldn't stand the thought of eating broccoli or cutting down on meat consumption. Well, look, if you're not doing anything, might as well put diet to the test, which is what they did. So are there other cancers we can test out plants on? Well, esophageal cancer is not the cancer to get. Most die within months of diagnosis, but the development of esophageal cancer is a multi-stage process. Start out with a normal esophagus, that's the tube that runs from your mouth to your stomach. It starts out fine, but then precancerous changes start to take place, then localized cancer starts to grow, and then eventually it spreads and, and, and then you die. But because of this well-defined stepwise progression of cancer, researchers jumped on it as a way to test the ability of berries, or healthiest fruits, to reverse this process. This is a randomized phase two um, clinical trial of strawberries. Six months eating the equivalent of a pound of fresh strawberries a day. That's a lot of strawberries, but the progression of disease was reversed in 80% of the patients. At the beginning of the study, none had a normal esophagus. At the end of the study, most lesions either regressed from moderate to mild or disappeared completely. Moderate to mild 
or from mild to just gone. At the end of the study, half of those on the high strawberry treatment walked away disease-free. 52.7% cure rate. So obviously, you know about this study. You've made headlines everywhere, right? Why? Because the strawberry lobby, of course, you, you always hear about Big Berry, right? This is a drop in tumor markers before and after, all because of what miraculous new drug? No, it was strawberries. Cellular proliferation before and after strawberry treatment. Same story with black raspberries and oral cancer. Most patients' lesions improved, including cases of complete clinical regression, meaning now you see it, now you don't a turning back on of tumor suppressor genes. So it was affecting people at a genetic level. Right? So even though maybe something like tobacco that actually is causing the oral cancer doesn't mean that diet still can't have a potent effect in affecting progression. Yet this kind of treasure remains buried, no pun intended, <clears throat> because nobody profits. Nobody, that is, except the hundreds of thousands of people that get diagnosed with these horrific cancers every year. And finally, let me end with infections. After the common cold, the most common infection is of the urinary tract. Now, we've known for decades that it's bacteria crawling up from the rectum um, that causes bladder infections, but only recently did we discover where this rectal reservoir of bladder infecting E. coli was coming from, and it's coming from chicken. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link between farm animals, meat, and bladder infections. Solid evidence that urinary tract infections can be a zoonosis, an animal-to-human disease. The best way to prevent bladder infections, the best way to prevent any infection, not get infected in the first place. You say, well, wait, can't I just use a meat thermometer, right? Cook the meat through, right? No, because of cross-contamination. Right? We've known for decades, you give someone a frozen chicken to prepare in their own home as they normally would, a multitude of antibiotic-resistant E. coli jump from the chicken into the gut of the volunteer, even before they eat it. The jump happens after the bird is prepared, but before any of the meat is eaten. So not only does it not matter how well you cook it, you could have reduced it to ash. Doesn't matter, didn't even have to eat it. It's the handling it that causes the infection. Within days, the drug-resistant chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming the major part of the person's gut floor. The chicken bacteria was like taking over the colon. What if you're really careful in the kitchen, though? Well, this important study, the effectiveness of hygiene procedures, the prevention of cross-contamination from uh, chicken carcasses in the domestic kitchen. They went to five dozen homes, gave everyone a chicken, asked them to cook it. Now, after they were done cooking, they found bacteria from chicken feces, and not just any, but serious human pathogens, salmonella and campylobacter, everywhere, on the cutting board. Utensils on their hands, on the fridge handles, the cupboard, the oven handle doorknob, right? Okay, but now this is before they cleaned up. What about after cleaning? Still, pathogenic uh, fecal bacteria everywhere. All right, and this was just regular chicken bought at the store, retail. They didn't inoculate it with bacteria. It just comes prepackaged with packages, pathogens, like saved them, saved them a step. They didn't have to do anything. Just gave it to them. Okay, obviously people don't know what they're doing in the kitchen. Right. So, they took another group of people, gave them specific instructions. Right? After you cook the chicken, you've got to wash everything um, in, in you know, hot water, detergent, told specifically, wash the cutting board. Knobs on the sink, the faucet, the fridge, the doorknobs, everything, all right? And the researchers still found disease-causing fecal matter chicken bugs everywhere. All right, fine. Last group. This time, they're going to insist that everybody bleach everything. <laughs> The dishcloth immersed in bleach disinfectant. Then they were told to, to spray the bleach on all the surfaces. All right, let the bleach disinfectant sit there for five minutes. And still, found Campylobacter and Seminole on some utensils, the dishcloth, the counter around the sink, and the cupboard. 
Now, certainly better, right? But unless our kitchen is like some biohazard lab, <laughs> the only way to guarantee we're not going to leave infection around the kitchen is to not bring it into our homes in the first place. Now, but the good news is, it's not like you eat chicken once and are colonized for life. In this study, the chicken bacteria only seemed to last about 10 days before your good bacteria could kind of muscle it out of the way. The problem is that many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days. So maybe constantly kind of recolonizing, reintroducing these chicken bugs into their systems. Anyway, there we have it. Top dozen reasons people see medical care mostly for diseases that could have been prevented. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, instead of treating the underlying causes, right, typically doctors treat risk factors. Right, giving a lifelong worth of medications to lower blood pressure, blood sugars, cholesterol. But look, these are just symptoms of underlying problems like disease, dysfunctional arteries. Disregarding the underlying causes and just treating risk factors is like, it's like mopping up the floor around an overflowing sink instead of just turning off the faucet. But drug companies are more than happy to sell us new rolls of paper towel every day for the rest of our lives. But when the underlying lifestyle causes are addressed, patients are often able to stop medications, avoid surgery. We spend billions cracking people's chests open, yet rarely does it actually extend anyone's life. In contrast, how about wiping out 90% of heart disease? Think about it. Heart disease accounts for more premature deaths than any other illness, almost completely preventable. Number one cause of death, almost completely preventable by changing diet and lifestyle. And those same, that same diet can prevent or reverse many other chronic diseases, the same diet. So why don't more doctors do it? Well, one reason is doctors don't get paid to do it. No one profits from lifestyle medicine. So it's not part of medical education or practice, right? Presently, you know, we, physicians lack the training or financial incentives, so they do what they were trained to do, prescribe medications and perform surgery. After Dean Ornish proved we could reverse our number one cause of death, heart disease, open up arteries without drugs, without surgery, you know, just with a plant-based diet and other healthy changes, he thought that his studies would have a meaningful effect on mainstream cardiology. I mean, after all, a cure for our number one killer? But he admits he was mistaken. He realized physician reimbursement is a more powerful determinant of medical practice than research. Reimbursement over research. Not a very flattering portrayal of the healing profession, but look, doctors aren't going to do it without getting paid, let's get them paid. So Dr. Ornish went to Washington, arguing, look, if we train and pay for doctors to practice lifestyle medicine, we could save trillions of dollars. And that's just talking you know, heart disease, diabetes, breast and prostate cancer. So the Take Back Your Health Act was introduced to the U.S. Senate to induce doctors to learn practice lifestyle medicine, not only because it works better, but the, the doctors actually get paid to do it. And the bill died, just like millions of Americans will continue to do with reversible chronic diseases. We have known for over a decade that the leading causes of premature death, persistent misery in this society are the chronic diseases that are attributable to the use of our feet, exercise, forks, diet, and fingers smoking. Right? Feet, forks, and fingers, kind of like the master levels of destiny, of medical destiny for millions of people. Now, we as a medical profession have known, right, Ornish published about 25 years ago, but we have not managed to care, writes the director of Yale University's Prevention Research Center, at least not care deeply enough to turn what we know into what we routinely do. Were we to do so, We'd be able to eliminate most heart disease, strokes, diabetes, cancer, but you know, saving millions of lives is just a, it's just a number. He asked doctors, look, forget the bland statistics of public health and ask yourself 
If you love someone who has suffered a heart attack, stroke, cancer, diabetes, now imagine their faces. Recall what it felt like to get the news. Now imagine eight out of ten of us wistfully reflecting on intimate love and loss, personal anguish, never got that dreadful news because it never happened. Mom did not get cancer. Dad did not have a heart attack. Grandpa didn't have a stroke. Sister, brother, aunt, uncle didn't lose a limb or eyes or kidneys to diabetes. We're all intimately linked in this network of personal tragedy that need never have happened, which leads to what he's asking doctors to do about it. He says, look, put a face on public health. When you're talking about cancer, diabetes, heart disease, ask the audience to see in their mind's eye the face of a loved one affected by the condition. Then imagine that loved one among the 80% who need never have succumbed if what we knew as doctors were what we do. Thank you. If you'd like to share this talk with others, it's available on DVD uh, for $10. If you missed last year's talk about the leading cause of death, I have that as well. I also have uh, my uh, series now up to volume 19, just came out last week, Latest in Clinical Nutrition. All the proceeds from the sales of all my books, DVDs, speaking engagements, all goes to charity, of course, and all my work is available free at nutritionfacts.org. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael Greger, for giving us, as always, a really wonderful and superb presentation of the uh, most recent findings um, in clinical nutrition that for many of us could also be life-saving information. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite all of you now to enjoy some tasty vegan foods provided courtesy of Down to Earth. Thank you all for coming. Mahalo. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344, or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.